All right. We're on. Gotta get a better microphone. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so, well, this is pretty familiar to you now because I haven't changed that for a while. Uh, that's just the homework list. So, um, uh, so finally, we're getting close to a due date at long last. Um, so that's Wednesday. Uh, so a lot of people have uh, finished that extra credit assignment um, uh, with the 88. So I've been trying to keep up with uh, the extra credit. Uh, remember, you can look at that in your my grades. That's in that assignment called calculus currency. Um, uh, but if you think I've made a mistake, then uh, let me know on your uh, on your uh, uh, bon uh, on your calculus currency so I can uh, fix that. Um, and the one thing I haven't added is if people have been going to the um, uh, SI sessions, uh, I haven't collected that part yet. Remember, you get uh, two dollars per session that you attend, so uh, I haven't collected that yet. Um, and so that's extra credit, and then the um, uh, so that's why it's got the asterisk there. And then the actual first official homework assignment, which is going into the grade book, uh, is this one, right? And that also is due on Wednesday. So most people have done this one. That one's pretty easy. So you should uh, bank a few dollars there at least, right? And uh, of course, this one's harder because that's an actual uh, official homework assignment that's going into your homework average. Um, and I think about um, 25 out of 40 people have worked on that one, and looks like people still have uh, uh, work left to be done on that. Remember, you can submit uh, questions five times, okay? So you've got plenty of opportunities to correct your mistakes. So you should be able to get your score up uh, on the homework assignments pretty qu uh, uh, pretty high, okay? Uh, and we're, we're really essentially finished talking about that um, material, reviewing that material. So we're now talking about the part two homework. So you can be working on that. That one's due Monday. And then your first quiz, uh, which has maybe 10 questions on it. Uh, uh, but remember, the help is turned off on that. Um, that's due um, a week from Wednesday. Uh, and so remember, your homeworks and your quizzes together that's 19% uh, uh, of your grade. So that is more than actual a midterm test. Uh, so um, it's, it, you know, it's important that you uh, keep your homework grade up, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and that will benefit your, your average uh, in the long run, um, you know, to keep your homework uh, grade um, up, right? Um, and then you've got this algebra review, which is not due for a while. Not many people. Some people have already got the 82 on that, but not many. Uh, so, again, uh, be working on that a little bit at a time because that's a long assignment. So uh, that's going to take a little bit to get, um, to get through that one, right? So you need an 82 on that one um, um, uh, to, get the, to bank the extra credit, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so... Um, but that will help you on your first test, I think. So you won't be making uh, 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 silly algebra mistakes on the first test. That's always frustrating when you, uh, you know, the you know the new material, but you make, uh, you know, computational mistakes, right, or sloppy errors. So this review will help you avoid that problem. Okay, that's why I put it in there. Um, I uh, uh, wanted to remind you about your um, the SI sessions. So uh, uh, remember, uh, uh, you do get some, uh, uh, some calculus currency for uh, going to the SI sessions. That's not the main point of going to the SI sessions, though. The main point of going to the SI sessions is to uh, you know, help answer your questions, right? So you will do really well um, uh, on your homeworks and on the first test. So, uh, so the times are right after class with John, but however, there are some other times. So you can go from 3.15, so if this time is not convenient, you can go from 3.15 to 4.15 on Wednesday um, and 11.30 to 12.30 on Tuesday, that's Tuesday, uh, with Fernando, who is um, another SI for another section uh, that actually meets right before this section, but they're using the same book, okay? So they're using exactly the same book as us, and 
um, uh, they're following uh, a very similar uh, syllabus to us. So uh, I think those sessions would be helpful if you cannot make it to uh, visit John. But you can also go on Friday from 12 to 5, okay? So there's an open uh, uh, lab from 12 to 5 on Friday, and someone should be there, I think, uh, to help answer your questions uh, on our uh, um, on our assignments. Okay, so uh, you, so uh, you will uh, when you go in, you will log in, right? So we'll have a record of you being there, and um, <clears throat> uh, that's important uh, for your extra credit. But more important to go is to um, you know. Um, prepare you better for your homeworks and your uh, uh, eventually for test number one. Okay. Um, all right. So, do y'all have any questions over uh, any of the homework so far, especially this part one, since that's coming up due Wednesday? We do have another chance to answer questions, but we are running out of time there. Oh, by the way, the um, remember now the grace period ends today, so it may have already ended. Uh, on the web assigned. So this is now the point where you are going to have to purchase access. Uh, if you do it online, it's 82, remember. And if uh, uh, if you um, do it through the bookstore, it's more expensive. But you don't need to purchase the book at the bookstore, just the web assigned access. Okay. Uh, you don't have to purchase a hard copy of the book, just the web assigned access. And uh, but it's more than 82, but less than the book. The book is really super expensive. Um, uh, but so I think it's going to freeze you out either starting today or after today um, until you, you know, actually purchase access. You won't lose your uh, any of the work that you've done. OK, but you won't be able to continue working on the assignments until uh, you actually purchase the access. Now, if you finish the first couple of assignments, then uh, nothing is due again until Monday. So you've got a, even a little bit more extra time, uh, although I wouldn't wait around too long to uh, work on this part two. Right. Um, of the homeworks. Um, but if you haven't finished those first two assignments, then, uh, well, now's the time to purchase the access, <laughs> okay? Um, we have now hit that, uh, you know, today is actually the, uh, no, Wednesday is actually the official day of record, okay? Uh, so you are officially in the class at that point and, you know, you can't get out, right? Okay, you're stuck. Um, all right, now I'm just teasing with you, but it is actually the official day of record, I think, on Wednesday. Um, okay, so questions? Now that we've got all that uh, <clears throat> logistical stuff out of the way. Questions about the homework? Is it easy? It is easy? Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, it won't always be easy, all right, but uh, if it's easy at the start, that's good, okay, because that gives you a chance there to uh, build up some nice scores, right? Okay, uh, you know there's this famous uh, uh, phrase uh, uh, in college, earn your A early, okay, so, um, and that means, uh, you know, get those, uh, uh, good scores, right, at the beginning of class while you've, uh, uh, you know, while before the material gets too challenging, right, okay, and then, uh, if you, uh, flub up a little bit at the end, it won't be so severe, right, okay, you won't feel like you're under such pressure, but if you're not making, uh, you know, if you're, uh, falling behind at the beginning, and then you're trying to catch up at the end where the material gets more challenging, Oh, that just makes it that much, uh, you know, that puts that much pressure on you and you just get stressed out and who knows what happens, right? You may wreck your car or something, you know. <laughs> Don't want that to happen, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> all right. So, not hearing any questions, or if you do have questions, you can bring them to John after class, okay? Uh, John does the homework also, so he knows all the answers, okay, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, this class and life in general. So, you can go ask John. What's the meaning of life, right? And um, he'll give you his version of that. Okay. You thought about that question before? No. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So hold off on that one until you get a chance to think about it. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, well, we're going to start talking about uh, uh, resume the notes then again. Okay. And. Um, uh, try to get through, finally get through, finished with review, okay? So we still got a little bit more review to do, but the stuff that we're going to start reviewing now is, um, uh, although it's still review uh, for most of you, some of you it may be a little bit new, but it's still review for most of you, um, uh, it's going to uh, be uh, uh, very much more closely related uh, to uh, 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 the material and calculus that we're going to be studying, okay? So we're inching there our way toward 
uh, learning some calculus. We're sort of dipping our toes in the water here uh, today, okay, uh, just a little bit. Uh, but let's finish the first set of notes first. I've got um, um, one more example to go through before we switch notes here. And by the way, if, of course, as always, right, remember the notes are posted uh, on the class web page, not in WebAssign, but on the class web page in Blackboard. And so far, the videos have been working pretty good. It's not quite the same as seeing me live, but uh, the videos are working, so um, you can review those as well. Oh, one example I skipped last time, and I'm going to skip it again today, uh, but it is in the notes, so you can look at it. I don't know if there's any problems in the homework like this immediately. Uh, it's in the book, but I don't know if there's any homework problems exactly like this. Um, this was uh, a question, um, kind of a, a, a basic algebra question uh, about functions. We had this function f of x is uh, uh, 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. So we had a function represented by a formula here. Okay, We didn't know much about how the function was, or anything actually, about how the function was being used in practice. We just had this function formula, okay, uh, 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. And um, we answered uh, a bunch of questions about that function. In, well, mainly what we were doing was evaluating uh, that function for different inputs, okay? But the very last question in that sequence was a little bit different. So that's part H here, where I didn't have much, quite much uh, uh, room to fill in the answer, but I did squeeze it in there. The question was, find the input that matches the given output. Almost always that question is asked in the opposite order. You'll be given the uh, input value and told find the matching output value. Okay? But here it's the opposite. We're given the output value and we're told to find the matching input value. Okay? So the way you do that, if you've got a function expressed as a formula, like in this example, is you simply take the output that you're given and you plug it in for the output side of the uh, function equation, okay? So remember the function equation, you can't see it up there now, but it was f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. So what we're being told here is that uh, f of x is going to be minus 2, and we want to find the x value that would give us minus 2 as f of x, okay? So uh, usually you're given the x value and uh, you know, asked to compute f of x. Here we're given f of x is minus 2, and we're asked to find the x value uh, that uh, produces that particular or matches that particular output. So the way you do that with a formula is you just plug in, as I just mentioned there, minus 2 for the uh, f of x side of the uh, function equation. Okay. So where uh, in the before where I had f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 3x minus 1, I'm going to plug in the minus 2 for f of x. And see, notice that leaves me an equation to solve. So I'm going to have to solve this equation to figure out those um, uh, to figure out those input values x that result in an output of minus 2. So you've got this equation to solve. Um, and so that kind of uh, uh, reminds you of how to solve equations a little bit. And this one's a somewhat challenging equation to solve because uh, the x is squared in this equation. So the unknown x is squared. So you've got to remind yourself, um, how do I solve equations where the unknown is squared? That's called a quadratic equation, remember? Okay. And you've solved equations like that many times. But uh, one way of solving that equation is to set it, the equation equal to 0. Right now it's set equal to minus 2. But I'm going to set the, uh, uh, the left-hand side of this equation to 0 by adding 2 to both sides of the equation. So I added 2 to both sides of the equation here. And that made the left-hand side 0. And then I'm going to try to solve that resulting equation, where I have 0 is equal to 2x squared plus 3x uh, plus 1. And one way to solve a quadratic equation like this, usually the easiest way to solve it if you can, is by factoring. Okay. So I'm going to try to factor the expression 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. And uh, if I can do that, that will allow me to figure out the solutions. Okay. If you can't uh, factor the 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, 
that doesn't mean you can't solve the equation, but you're gonna, it's going to take a little bit of extra work okay, to do that. But I get lucky in this case. In this case, 2x squared plus 3x plus 1 does factor. It factors as 2x plus 1 times x plus 1. So if you don't believe that, just take 2x plus 1 times x plus 1, multiply those back together, and you'll see you get 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. Okay? So it does uh, uh, factor. The right-hand side of the equation does factor here. And that means then that I have a product here that equals 0. So 2x plus 1, that quantity, times x plus 1, that second quantity, is equal to 0. Well, the only way that happens, you can get a product is equal to 0, is if one of the factors is 0. So see, I can use that fact. So I know that either 2x plus 1 has to be 0, or x plus 1 has to be 0. One or the other has to be 0, because that's the only way I can multiply these two quantities together and get 0. But if I set 2x plus 1 equals 0, that now is a much easier equation to solve, right? That's so easy to solve. I can just subtract 1 from both sides of the equation. I didn't show that step. But I can subtract 1 from both sides of the equation and then divide both sides by 2. So there's one of my solutions to the equation x equals minus 1 half. Okay? And x, uh, uh, the other possibility is x plus 1 is equal to 0. And that one is even easier to solve because all I have to do is subtract 1 from both sides of the equation. So when I do that, I get x equals minus 1. Ah, so there are my two answers to this uh, original question. Either one of these inputs, x equal minus 1 half or x equal minus 1, if I plug those into the function for x, the resulting output will be negative 2. Okay? Uh, uh, so that's how I answered uh, the question. All right? <clears throat> so that's in the notes. Uh, but I, we, well, we went through it there real quickly, okay? Um, uh, but if that comes up in the homework, you know, you're given a function formula and you're given a, a, an output value and you're told find the matching input, well, there's an example of how you can do that, uh, provided you can solve the equation. That's the hard part, okay? Uh, setting up the equation is not the hard part. It's really solving the equation. That's the part that most people get tripped up on. Okay? Um, be very careful when you're reading these homework problems uh, to distinguish between inputs and outputs. Okay? So students often get sloppy, and they don't read the question very carefully because they think they, you know, they glance at the question, they think they know what it's asking them. They don't read the question very carefully, but be sure you're distinguishing what the question is asking you for. Is it asking you for an input value? Or is it asking you for an output value? So most of the time, you'll be asked to, to uh, find an output value. But sometimes it's backwards like this one. You'll be asked to find an input value. So make sure you're uh, 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 tuned in to what's being asked of you. Um, OK, that's just a, a, that's something that's going to trip you up on the test, like uh, some of you on the test, I promise you. So don't let you be the one who makes that mistake. OK? Um, all right, finally now, let's go down to our last example. Okay, all right, so um, here we have another function formula, and we talked about this one a little bit at, uh, last time. What this uh, um, uh, uh, formula gives you is what's called the food price index, and that's a way of measuring the general price of food uh, if you go purchase uh, food items from the grocery store. So it's not the price of a single item. But it's a, a, a price, uh, it's a way of sort of uh, 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 combining the prices of several items to give you an idea of uh, how, much, how expensive food is, okay? So when this food price index goes up, that means food has become more expensive, okay? Not quite sure what caused the, uh, 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 the index to go up. It could have been maybe the price of meat has gone up or you know maybe the price of milk has gone up or maybe the price of bread has gone up right okay or maybe the price of produce has gone up okay but uh, 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 and nonetheless uh, in general when this index goes up that means that the price of food the food that uh, people typically purchase okay um, has gone up okay and when the index goes down that means um, uh, 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 the food prices have gone down, all right? And so the input to our uh, 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 formula here is going to be elapsed years. So we're using elapsed years again, one of our favorite inputs. And we're counting years from the year uh, 2000, okay? Uh, one thing I want you to notice, though, is um, this index is, uh, this formula is only valid from 
2000 to 2010. Okay, so um, um, so outside of uh, that range of years, um, this particular formula uh, isn't valid. So what does that tell us about the domain of this function? So what numbers can we use as inputs here for uh, uh, our input uh, uh, t uh, in this formula? Not 1 through 10, actually, but close. Actually, 0 through 10. Don't forget 0 is a possibility, too. Okay? So, yeah, the, uh, the index starts in year 0. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry. It's the uh, uh, the uh, formula uh, applies to year 2000. That would be elapsed year 0. Okay? Because that's 0 years after 2000. And it goes up to uh, the formula is valid up to year 2010. Okay? So this is a little bit in the past. Up to 2010. Um, and that would be elapsed year 10. Okay? So our domain is not 1 through 10, but 0 to 10. Okay? Um, so if you write that domain down uh, in interval notation, which is our favorite way of writing down domains, uh, you would put uh, starting uh, uh, our input, uh, I'm sorry, our domain begins at 0, okay? Including 0, because you can have a last year 0. That would be exactly the year 2000. And goes up to, y'all said what, 10, right? Okay? Which corresponds to. Um, 2010. That's not the question that was asked, okay, but I just wanted to uh, uh, remind you there about domain, okay? I have no idea what the range is, okay? Uh, very hard to determine uh, what the range is from looking at uh, the formula, okay? But the question that's asked it kind of has to do with the range, okay? Remember, the range is the set of output values that you can get from the function formula, and here's the question that's asked. It says, um, okay, during this uh, time period, when was food the most expensive? Okay, so that's exactly what that um, function formula is designed to help you answer. Okay, is uh, when was food most expensive? When was food least expensive? When were food prices uh, increasing? When were food prices de decreasing during this uh, time interval? Okay, um, all right. I have no idea by looking at the formula how to answer that question, right? Okay. Who knows, all right, uh, 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 from looking at the formula, when food was most expensive, okay? See, the formula is not really a convenient way of answering that question, at least not answering it quickly, okay? But remember, I can uh, change that function expression to other forms, correct, uh, Robert, all right? And if I had it in other forms, that might help me answer the question. So uh, what should I really do with this uh, function formula to answer this question? Just guess or um, pick a year and hope for the best or so how can I use my knowledge of functions to help me answer that question? Yeah, I can plug in points, okay? So you're saying plug in values for t. Okay, right, and that I can do that. Okay, and that would be, um, uh, uh, you know, that would take me a little while because that's kind of a complicated formula, right? Okay, so someone suggested there, you know, plugging in different values for t, right, and examining uh, what the food, you know, what I get as the output here for my food price index. Okay, and but that's but that would require a lot of arithmetic possibly, right, Fergie? Okay. Because, see, there's a lot of ugly arithmetic in that uh, formula. But that's one way of going about it if you had plenty of time, okay? But uh, 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 let's think a little bit smarter here. What else could we do? Someone said what? Yeah, that's right. Turn this into a graph, okay? That's essentially what a graph is, okay? Is uh, 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 what a graph has done for us is plug in a bunch of inputs, right, okay? and uh, uh, determined uh, the uh, matching outputs, right, and then plotted those input outputs as points, okay? So you see a graph is kind of a shorthand version of doing all of that uh, arithmetic, all right? Now, if I had to make the graph by hand, uh, you know, constructing the graph wouldn't be um, 
uh, any easier than uh, you know plugging in uh, values for t okay but i'm not going to make the graph by hand okay you see right so we're in 2016 now so we're not going to make the graph by hand instead we're going to rely on the computer to help us make the graph okay and that will be a great time saving uh, device for us all right uh, all right so uh, uh, there are lots of different programs that you can use to help you uh, graph function formulas we're going to use one called desmos.com okay uh, which i like a lot okay so uh, we're going to be using this one uh, frequently throughout the course it's really easy to use all right and um, that's the so it's a web page okay it's free and you just have to go to it and let me see if i've got it already uh, sort of open there yeah okay um so uh, 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 just go to www.desmos.com and uh, you'll see this page, all right? And then just choose their start graphing, okay? And uh, what it's going to do is uh, open up for you uh, a, a graphing calculator page, all right? And all you have to do is type in here your uh, formula, okay? Uh, type in your formula and it will graph there uh, on the right hand side of the page there uh, the formula okay and you can plug it in there term by uh, term all right so let's go back to our um, let's go back to our um, our formula and let me write this on the board so I can remember it so I can see that as I'm uh, Typing into Desmos, okay. So that's what uh, uh, minus uh, uh, a point one one zero one one three uh, t cubed, okay, uh, plus and then what point um, uh, zero six eight uh, t squared, right? And then is it another plus there? Yeah. yeah. Plus point one nine eight uh, times t and then finally that last constant term is ninety nine uh, point one okay and that's essentially uh, all you have to type into uh, desmos okay uh, now I am going to change the input variable though from t to x because I think desmos likes um, t a little uh, sorry likes x a little bit better as the input variable but we can experiment with that and see if it will accept t, okay? So don't let me make a mistake here. So let's see, it's 0. what? Um, oh, it's minus. See, y'all already <coughs> saved me there. So 0. 0.0113, okay? Did I get that right? Okay. And then I'm going to use x, all right? And now to get the exponent, uh, just use the uh, 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 shift. Uh, uh, carrot okay so the shift of the six key that's the carrot all right and that will give you uh, see that nice uh, pretty exponent there okay and then I hit the right arrow key just to come out of the exponent all right and then uh, just start typing in uh, the rest of the terms so plus there and then um, uh, 0.068 and now uh, x squared so see I hit the carrot key there right okay so that's the shift of the six and notice that it's gonna graph dynamically as I'm typing in terms okay so that's the graph actually of the uh, uh, first two terms there that you see okay but we're not through there right and then um, <clears throat> keep going all right and so the I don't know if you really need to type in the zero but I'll do it just for to be nice okay so the point zero one nine eight times x okay and then the uh, plus ninety nine point one all right and uh oh you see something ugly has happened to us we appear to have lost the graph okay now we actually haven't lost the graph uh, if you've typed in an expression that is invalid expression uh, Desmos will give you some sort of error message to that effect okay so Desmos has actually made this graph okay uh, the reason we can't see it is because that graph is outside of our graphing window okay so notice on the right hand side here our graphing window is minus 8 to 10 on the x-axis and then you know a little bit b below minus 2 up to 6 there on the y-axis and that's why we cannot see 
uh, the graph. Okay, so what we're going to have to do is uh, look around for it uh, uh, in the graphing window and see if we can find that uh, see if we can find that graph. Okay, um, uh, I I think what happened was I could see that pretty nicely, right? until I typed in that 99.1, right, okay, and that's when it disappeared. So I think what happened is everything has gotten shifted up there roughly by, you know, 99, okay. So let's look up the uh, 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 y-axis and see if we can find uh, our graph, okay. So I'm going to have to scroll up here, and you can just drag uh, the graphing window in Desmos, Ah, and finally, there it is uh, coming into view, okay? Ah, okay, so, ah, there, finally, now we can see our, there we can see our graph. Now, remember, what's the domain of our curve, okay? So, what's the domain of our function? Where does the domain begin at? Zero. Zero. So, ignore this part of the graph, because that really shouldn't be there, Okay. Remember, our domain begins at zero, so it, it begins right here at the y-axis and goes over to where? Ten. ten. Right. Okay. So it goes over there to ten. Okay. And there you can see what's happened to the food price index from 2000 to 2010. Okay. So what do we see has happened? Right. At first, food prices in general, right, were uh, what was happening to food prices in general? Yeah, they were increasing until they maxed out right about there, right? Okay, and then they started, yeah, they started dropping. Okay, so for some reason there, something nice happened and food prices started dropping. And actually, they were a little below where they started in 2000 by 2010. Okay, um, <clears throat> all right. So now it's very easy, right, to look at that graph and answer that question: When were uh, food prices most expensive? 2005, that's right, okay, uh, right there uh, where that graph uh, peaks out there, okay. Let's see what that, uh, uh, and Desmos is very kind, it will tell you, okay, uh, that actual uh, 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 maximum point there is approximately 5.147, so right there in 1995, very close to that, and, I'm sorry, 2005, very close to that, right, and your food price index had gone up to uh, 100.38, right, at that time, okay? So, see, looking at that graph, right, just so easy uh, to answer that question. Um, it's just almost trivial, right? So we can see uh, that it was 2005, right? Okay. See, that's, the, that's one of the nice things about, uh, that's one of the nice things about graphs, right? Okay, so you can answer that question there just, uh, uh, really quickly, uh, if you can make the graph easily, okay, right? If you can make the graph easily, right? Okay, so that's kind of a big if, all right? But if you can make that graph easily, then questions like this become uh, very easy to answer. Now, what we're going to work on, okay, uh, the first part of the semester here, uh, uh, what we're going to learn is, hmm, how do I answer that question without making the graph? Okay, so if I uh, uh, was stranded on a desert island and had to answer this question, that's kind of a fanciful scenario there, okay? But if I couldn't make the graph, right, okay, how could I answer that question, okay? So uh, from just the formula itself, Virgie, how could I have uh, uh, figured out that, uh, oh, it was 2005 uh, uh, when the uh, uh, food prices were maximum? And that's what calculus is going to help us, one of the things that calculus is going to help us do, okay? Um, all right. <clears throat> okay. So that's it for our um, first set of notes about review. Okay. And now let's switch over to the second set of notes. Okay. Yeah, John. Uh, John's going to pass out the uh, roll sheet now. Okay. All right. So y'all have been really good the first couple of weeks with attendance. So I really want y'all to keep that up. Okay. Uh, keep up your uh, good attendance. So even when the weather gets a little bit dicey here, because it's not going to be beautiful all the way through the spring, okay? So we're going to have some cruddy days, okay? Uh, 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 but don't uh, be tempted there uh, when the weather is bad to, uh, uh, you know, to blow off class on Monday morning. It's easy to do, okay? Uh, I know the feeling. I was a student too, right? Uh, but uh, try to stick with the good attendance because that will just... 
uh, be uh, that much uh, uh, better for your uh, uh, for your grade prospects. Okay. Um, now, one thing about the roll sheet, remember, be sure to sign in your slot, okay? So that was the slot you signed in on day one, okay? So I've got day one there attached to the, uh, the back of that roll sheet, right? So you can look and see where you signed on day one. Make sure you always sign in that slot because that's where I'm going to be looking for your name uh, when I'm checking attendance, all right? If I don't see it there, then, uh, you know, you're liable to get counted absent inadvertently, okay? All right, um, uh, this is again uh, a little bit more of review, okay? But I, I needed to go through this because this is a, a kind of question that uh, throws students off, all right? And um, it, it throws uh, 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 even advanced math students off, okay? This is just one thing that doesn't sink in very well, but I don't know why, okay? But um, <clears throat> uh, it says uh, you've, we've got a bunch of, uh, we have three examples here of functions. Uh, represented by formulas, I think there are three examples, of uh, functions represented by formulas, and uh, 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 we're not told anything about how the functions are being used in practice, and all we're asked is to find the domain of the function. Much more interesting question is what's the range of the function, okay? And that's a question that calculus can help us with, but we haven't gotten there yet, all right? So we're going to start with the easier question, which is what's the domain of the function? So what numbers can we use as inputs, as uh, uh, values for x in these formulas, all right? Um, okay, uh, if you're given a function to you that's represented by a formula and you're not told how the function is being used in practice, so you don't know what that quantity x is measuring, you don't know if that is distance or weight or time, you just know, okay, I have this quantity x, right? And um, uh, it's input to a function. Uh, formula. Okay, then the only thing you can do to answer this question, what is the domain, is just look at the formula and figure out for what values of x can you do the arithmetic that's involved in the formula. Okay, and uh, if if you can do the arithmetic uh, for you know a value of x, then you're going to include it in the domain. All right. Okay. So uh, if you don't have a function given to you in context, right, that's just the only way you can really answer this question. Right. So let's look at this first example in trying to figure out what the domain is here. What values can we plug into x in this uh, function formula? And you see in the formula, you have very simple arithmetic, right? You've got x squared. That means x times x. So that's just multiplication. Here you have 3 times x, right? So that's multiplication again, right? And there you've got a couple of subtractions. So that's very easy arithmetic. So actually, any value you plug in for x you'll be able to carry out the arithmetic in this formula. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy if you plug in a really weird value for x, right? Okay? I'm not saying the arithmetic is you know, something you'll want to do by hand, but at least uh, you know, theoretically you could carry out the arithmetic, right? May, may need a calculator to help you do it, okay? but you could carry out the arithmetic, right? and you could get a, 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 an output value. right? Okay? Uh, and so what that tells us is uh, uh, this function has a very easy domain, it's just going to be all real numbers. See, you can plug any number in for x into that formula and uh, you know, grind through the, that arithmetic and get an output value. All right? So uh, that's the easiest type of function uh, 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 to deal with uh, in terms of its domain. Okay? The domain is just all real numbers. How do we write that down in interval notation? I think we've done that once in the class already. So if I want to write that down, I could write that in words, all real numbers, and that's really okay. I would accept that on a test. But uh, uh, how do you write the, uh, all real numbers in interval notation? Ne yeah, negative infinity, right? So all real numbers start at negative infinity, and they go up to positive infinity, correct? And remember, those are the two symbols that we use for negative and positive infinity. But these are not actually numbers. Okay, these are just symbols that we use to represent this idea of negative and positive infinity. So do not put a square bracket here. You cannot include negative infinity in your domain. That is not actually a real number. And you cannot include positive infinity in your domain because that is not actually a real number. So technically, you need to put parentheses there. All right. All right. Now, so that's a very that's the easiest uh, type of example. Now here's one that's a little bit trickier, and this illustrates uh, one of the issues that comes up with uh, 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 domains of uh, uh, functions represented by formulas. Okay, so again, that is a pretty simple formula. You just have one divided by two minus four x. 
So, you know, you're looking at that formula and you're thinking, um, oh, that's pretty simple arithmetic. Again, so you don't know how that function is being used in practice. So you don't know if that input quantity X is distance or weight or time or, you know, those are the typical quantities that we use as inputs. But you don't know that here, right? It's just some quantity X, right? Who knows what it is, okay? So, um, uh, again, to determine the domain, what you have to figure out is, you know, what values can you plug in for X and carry out the arithmetic? So at first glance, you might think, well, this arithmetic is even easier than the arithmetic in that first example, because all I have in this problem is, well, there's a multiplication, right? That's four times X, so that's easy arithmetic. There's a subtraction, you know, subtraction, that's easy. And then there's a division. That's a pretty easy operation also, right? So you might think, again, the domain is all real numbers, okay? And unfortunately, that's not quite correct, okay, because the operation of division sometimes is an issue, okay? I'm not saying it's an issue in terms of, uh, 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 you know, uh, carrying out the arithmetic, okay? But remember, you cannot divide always by every number, in fact, what number can you not divide by? Zero, right. You cannot divide by zero. So you've got to make sure that whatever value you plug in for x here does not make 2 minus 4x zero, because you'll end up with 1 divided by zero there. And even your calculator won't do 1 divided by zero for you. If you try that on a calculator, it will give you an error message. All right. So that is the issue with this formula. We cannot divide by zero. So we have to be careful to not plug in a value for x that's causing us to divide by zero. Okay? Now, you might be able to just look at that formula and figure out uh, what x values you have to exclude then. Okay? You can figure out hmm, what x values are going to make 2 minus 4x equals zero. But there's a systematic way of figuring that out. All right? Just take the 2 minus 4x and set it equal to zero and solve that equation. Okay, that will tell you uh, what x values you cannot plug into this formula, right? So if you solve this equation, you'll be able to figure out what x values are going to make 2 minus 4x equals 0 and cause me to end up with 1 divided by 0 here in this expression. All right, that's a pretty easy equation to solve, right? How would we solve that equation? Just do what? Uh, we could subtract 2 from both sides, right? Okay, I was going to do it a little bit different, but that's fine. So subtract 2 from both sides. That gives us minus 4x. Don't forget about that minus sign there. Is equal to minus 2. And then do what? Divide by negative 4. Divide by negative 4, yeah. Okay, we got to get rid of that negative 4, right? So you don't add 4 here, but there you divide by negative 4. And what does that result in? That looks like x equals minus 2 divided by minus 4 which is better known as what? One half. One half, right. Ah, there it is. Okay. Ah, so that is the, that number you cannot plug in for X. If you plug one half in for X, you're going to end up with zero in the denominator of this expression and you'll have one over zero, which you cannot do. Okay. So what your domain is, is really all real numbers except one half. Okay, so everything else is fine, but not one half. The way I like to say that is I actually like to write that one out in words because um, that one's kind of tricky to write down in interval notation, but I'll show you both ways. So this one I would accept in words, all real numbers except one half. Okay, so everything works except one half as uh, input to this formula. All right, if you want to write that out in interval notation, though, here's what it looks like. Okay, it's going to look real messy. Okay, this would be all numbers from minus infinity up to one half, but not including one half, combined with all numbers from one half out to positive infinity, but not including one half. So you see what we've done there is we have uh, left off one half from all real numbers. Okay, um, you get two different sets here, so you can combine those two sets into one set by using what's called the union operation. So that's the way to write this set out in interval notation. 
That's why I like to write it out in words better because it's easier to write it in words than to write it in interval notation. But that works too, okay? The interval notation works. So from minus infinity to one-half, but not including one-half, and then from one-half to infinity, but again, not including one-half. So what you've, what you've left off there is one-half, which is exactly what we have to leave off, okay? So almost all real numbers, but not quite. All right, here's exactly the same situation, okay? All right. So let's think about this one. All right, so we look at that formula, and that's kind of an ugly formula, right? Okay, but when we start thinking about the arithmetic in the formula, it's not all that bad. We have, uh, you know, x minus 3. That should be you know, subtraction. That's easy. That square is just multiplication. Here's multiplication. We have some subtractions, right? So, so far, you know, not really bad arithmetic, right? Looks like we can carry out that arithmetic for almost any number. But what's the one bad thing here? Yeah, we have division, okay? And see, that operation is an issue sometimes. You cannot divide by zero, okay? So we've got to be careful to not plug a number in for x that's going to cause us to divide by zero, okay? All right, so you don't have to guess at what that number is, okay? You don't have to guess at what that number is. All you have to do is take your denominator, not the top, but take the bottom, and set it equal to zero, and try solving that equation. And that will tell you what numbers you cannot substitute for x. Okay? Ah, what sort of equation is that now? Begins with a q? Quadratic. Quadratic. I just solved one like that or showed you a solution to one like that a minute ago. What's the easiest way to solving an equation like that? It's the f word. Factor, right. So see if you can solve, x, uh, see if you can factor x squared minus 3x minus 10. If you can factor that, then you can find the solutions to that equation. And that will tell you what numbers are not going in your domain, not going in the domain. All right, I'm going to give you all a second to think about that. So try factoring x squared minus 3x minus 10. Give you a chance to review your factoring a little bit. And then tell me what the solutions to this equation are. And then, likewise, what numbers cannot be in the domain of this particular function. All right. All right. So take a couple of minutes to do that. Talk with your neighbor. OK, because I may call on somebody. I already know who it is. All right. OK. And I'm going to ask them to uh, show the class um, their solution to that. All right. So don't be shy to talk to your neighbor. OK, if you don't remember how to do this. If you have to turn around and talk to someone, that's fine, okay, right? <clears throat> two heads are better than one. Three heads are better than two. That's actually true. Actually, the more heads you have, the better it is, okay? That's a fact. This one does factor, by the way. I think I set it up so that it does factor. <laughs> Sometimes I ask this question, then I realize, no, it won't even factor, and then everybody's looking at me cross.
Okay, I have someone on the hot seat here. Now, the, remember, uh, uh, the reason, one reason I'm calling your names is because we have a class participation component of your grade, so I don't do this to embarrass people, okay? That's just kind of, you know, uh, extra fun, but no, I'm not doing this to embarrass you. Well, uh, uh, I, I want to make sure that uh, uh, when I ask you a question, right, that um, uh, 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 if you don't know the answer, uh, you will have an opportunity uh, to uh, uh, learn about the answer, right? Okay. So, uh, but most of the time, everybody uh, knows the answers really well. Okay. All right. So Juan, where's Juan? Juan here. Juan. Okay. All right. So Juan, um, we've got that equation to solve x squared minus 3x minus 10. So we already know we're going to factor x squared minus 3x minus 10. Were you able to factor that? Okay, so Danny was Danny, right? Okay, so Danny was helping you. All right, so Danny, did you ha uh, uh, tell Juan how to factor that. Okay, and at the same time, uh, tell the rest of the class too. Okay, at the same time, did you were you able to factor it? Yeah, I mean. Uh, okay, all right. So so talk to Juan there, but but the uh, class will overhear you. Right now. X minus five times x plus two. That was. Uh, Danny's factorization, x minus 5 times x plus 2, okay? All right, Juan, let's see if Danny is, um, uh, let's see if Danny is uh, 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 steering you in the right direction, okay? So let's check to see if his factorization is in fact correct, okay? Okay, and the way you can check that one is by multiplying back through, Okay, because if you multiply back through and you don't get what you originally started with, then that means that uh, you need to tell Danny to go back to the drawing board. Okay, but um, but so Juan, let's check that. So Juan, how do we multiply back together x minus five times x plus two? X times x, which gives us what? X squared, right? Negative 5 multiplied by 2, which is what? Negative 10. I'm going to write that at the end. Okay. And then keep going. Whoops. Minus 5 times x. Perfect. And one more product there. Yeah, you said it, what? 2 times x, right. 2 times x, yeah. See, what uh, uh, what Juan was doing there perfectly was multiplying every term in the first uh, uh, quantity by every term in the second. So he multiplied x by x, that gave x squared. Minus 5 times plus 2, that gave minus 10. Minus 5 times x was minus 5x, and then x times 2 was plus 2x. Was Danny right there, Juan? So did Danny have it factored right? Yeah, he did, right, okay, because this is the same as this, right, because minus 5x plus 2x is minus 3x, right, okay, so Danny got off, uh, 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 got the factoring right, okay, Juan, now, once we've got it factored, okay, so Danny gave you a hit on the factoring, once you've got it factored, then why does that immediately lead you to the solutions, okay, so once you've got it factored, why do you know that, oh, now you're really home free, Uh, what now? Yeah, so why can you at this point really get the solutions really quickly? Okay, so why is the factoring so crucial there to helping us solve uh, that equation? Okay, do you remember what we did in the previous example? We pretty much broke it down from there. We broke it down from there by doing what? No, no. Okay. Uh, 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 from the uh, ignore the third line. The x minus five times the x plus two equals zero line. See, that's where I've got the arrow written. What am I going to write down from there? Okay. So, what's oh, the? Uh, you're going to write x minus five, and then you're going to pretty much add additional five. Perfect. Yes, that's right. I'm going to write down x minus five. Okay. So I'm going to write down x minus 5, 
And but not just x minus five. I'm going to write x minus five. Exactly, yeah, x minus 5 equals 0, and then, then you're going to solve that equation, right, Juan? And you just told me how to solve it. How do I solve it? Add 5 to both sides, and that will leave me with what? x equals 5, yeah, ah. So there is one solution to the equation, x equals 5. And now, do the same thing for this one, Juan. So what do I write down also? x plus 2, what? Equals 0. And now how do I solve that one? Subtract 2 on both sides. So that will give me what? X equals how much? Negative 2. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excellent. Yeah, that's exactly right. So there are the two solutions to the equation. X equals 5 and X equals minus 2. Okay. And those now are the two numbers that are not in the domain. Remember, you got to remember, oh. So it's almost easy to forget. What was the original problem? The original problem was what was the domain of this function, right? Okay. So what is the domain of the function then, one? I can write it out in words. So what's the easy way to write that in words, thinking of that one as my example? There you go, right. All real numbers uh, except... 5 and minus 2. Ah, perfect. Okay. Great. So see, when you see that one on the test, one, that's the one I know you're going to get, right? Okay. But one thing, one, go through the algebra review, okay, and, because it's got some factoring problems in it. That, al that extra credit algebra review has some factoring problems in it, and that will help remind you about the factoring. That's easy to forget, okay, because that's not something people do all the time, right, okay? So when you go through the algebra review, that will help you remember uh, some of your factoring skills. Okay, so there's a little reminder about domains of functions represented by formulas. Usually they're pretty easy to determine, okay, but you have to think sometimes about the arithmetic that's in the formula, and if you cannot carry out that arithmetic for certain numbers, you have to exclude those numbers from the domain. And dividing by zero is one of the uh, uh, real uh, things you have to watch out for. Okay, now we we're going to write down some uh, 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 definitions, and these definitions, uh, they're, they're harder to write out than they are to think about, okay? So this first definition is for what we're going to call function direction, okay? And uh, here's what function direction is. There are three function directions uh, uh, that a function can exhibit, okay? And, but I do want to point out that uh, a, a function can change directions uh, 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 over the domain of the function. So when you're talking about the direction of the function, you're always referring to a specific interval of inputs, okay? Because the functions will change directions uh, 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 as you move through the domain of the function, all right? Okay, so uh, 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 a function is said to be increasing uh, over an input interval, okay? We, we always say over an input interval for some reason. Um, uh, a, a function is said to be increasing over an input interval if the output values increase, okay, if the output values increase when the input values increase, okay? So uh, as the input values are increasing, in other words, as you're moving left to right on the x-axis, if the output values are going up, increasing, then we say the function is increasing, all right? On the other hand, if the output values are going down, if the output values are uh, decreasing, again, as the input values increase, so notice the input values are always increasing here, okay, um, then we say that the function itself is decreasing, all right? And finally, if the output values are remaining the same, you know, output values don't have to go up or down. They can stay steady, okay? If the output values are remaining the same as the input values increase, then we say that the function is constant, all right? 
Um, this one is not going to be, uh, 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 we're not going to see this direction as much as we see increasing and decreasing, okay? But that one can occur, okay? Uh, the function outputs can remain steady, uh, and if that's the case, then we say the function is constant, all right? Let's look at a, a, an example, and if you can process this example, You've really got it down, okay? So the um, you know the the, the 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 definitions there are kind of wordy, okay? But the idea is pretty simple. So if you can understand this example, um, you really understand increasing and decreasing, okay? All right, let's look at this. So here we have a nice curvy uh, uh, function graph, okay? Nice curvy function graph. Uh, I want you to notice, by the way that um, the domain of this function does not stop on the right, and it doesn't stop on the left either. If I wanted the domain to stop, I would have to put some dots here to cut off the graph, okay? So although you can't see it, this graph is going to continue, okay? Probably it's going to continue like this. I'm not sure on the right. And on the left, it's probably going to continue like that, okay? But, you know, we're not completely certain of that. All right, that's our assumption. All right. So what we want to figure out is, okay, where is this function increasing and where is it decreasing? Okay. So it's nice and wiggly. So sometimes the outputs are going up, you see, and sometimes the outputs are going down, right? Okay. So sometimes the y values are going up and sometimes the y values are going down. And what we want to determine is where does that occur? Okay. Uh, so where are the outputs uh, uh, going up? Where's the function increasing? Where are the outputs going down? Where is the function decreasing, All right? Let's start with um, increasing first for no good reason. And we're going to give our answer, okay? Uh, we're going to give our answer here in terms of an interval or maybe a combination of intervals, all right? So it may be multiple intervals, okay? But I want you to remember the intervals are always intervals of inputs, Okay, the intervals are always going to be intervals of inputs. So do not write down output values here. You're only going to write down x values when you answer this sort of question. Okay, all right. So how do we figure out where the function is increasing? It's pretty easy. Just look at the x-axis. That's where the inputs are, right? Okay, and just scan the x-axis from left to right. Okay, because in the definition, notice that the input values, the x values are always increasing. That's the way the definition is written. Okay, so scan the x values from left to right. So as you're moving from left to right on the x axis, what are what's happening to the output values at first? Yeah, yeah, you're starting down here somewhere, at ne you know, close to negative infinity, and the output values are going what? Up or down? Uh, up. up, right? Okay. So that means that at first the function, the output values are increasing, but in that case we say the whole function is increasing. All right. Now, however, you've got to give your answer in terms of the x-axis. So where is it on the x-axis that the outputs are uh, going up? So that starts where on the x-axis? Looks like all the way out at negative infinity. I'm not sure of that, right? But it looks like all the way out at negative infinity. And the output values keep going up until where on the x-axis? Zero. That's where it stops, right? Okay, because it looks like the graph peaks out there right at... Uh, zero on the x-axis. Not zero on the y-axis, right? But zero on the x-axis. So that's our first interval where the function is increasing. Write that down in interval notation. Minus infinity to zero. Uh, you're always going to use, by the way, uh, 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 the parentheses uh, uh, when you're writing down where a function is increasing or decreasing. Okay? So just get in the habit of using the parentheses. It's not the end of the world if you use the bracket, but uh, uh, it's supposed to be parentheses, okay? All right, now, the, uh, uh, as we keep moving from left to right on the x-axis, what's happening to the y values? What's happening to the output values? Yeah, then they're decreasing for a little while, right? And that decreasing behavior stops when we hit what? Four. four. Yeah, when we hit four on the x-axis, right? And then after that, it looks like what? Increasing again, correct. Apparently, forever, all right? So our second place on the x-axis where the function is increasing is 4 and apparently all the way out to infinity on the x-axis. So you've got two different places where the function is increasing. 
you combine those with that union operation. All right. So there's the set where the function is increasing. Very easy, right? Okay. Just scan the x-axis from left to right. Okay. Where the y values are going up, it's increasing. Where the y values are going down, decreasing, right? And always give your answer in terms of the x-axis. So don't say it's increasing from negative infinity to that looks like 12 or something. All right. Don't say from negative infinity up to 12, because there you're giving the answer in terms of the y-axis, right? Don't give your answer in terms of the y-axis. Always give it in terms of the x-axis. Uh, where is it decreasing then? Well. We already really answered that, right? Okay. So where is it decreasing? Zero. Starting at zero, going where? Four. four. Right. So decreasing from zero to four. Right. Okay. So that set of inputs is where the outputs are going down, right? From zero on the x-axis to four on the x-axis, the outputs are falling. These two points now are very important to us. Okay, those are we're going to use to answer a lot of questions in this class. That's where it switches from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Those are called, I call them turning points. So that's my name for that point where the, gra where the graph forms a peak or a valley. That's called a turning point. So you have two turning points here. One of them is a peak turning point, and the second one is a valley turning point. Okay. So a turning point right there, and another turning point right here. Okay. All right, let's try another one, just for extra practice. So again, where is this function? Increasing, decreasing, and possibly constant. And so keep in mind now, I didn't cut the graph off, so it looks like it's going to continue on the left and the right in the same pattern. All right. Okay, so to answer, let's start with increasing. Just scan the x-axis from left to right. Just scan the x-axis from left to right there. Okay. And... Uh, is it decreasing at first? Yeah, it's decreasing. And then what's happening right here in the middle? It's constant, right? Notice it's staying steady right there at the output of 1. So we've got a constant piece here also. So I need to add that in. So most graphs won't have a constant piece, but this one does. Okay. And then finally, over here on the far right, that's where it's increasing, right? So where does that start at? Five, right. Okay. And continues apparently on the x-axis how far? Indefinitely, right. So I'm not really sure, so I'm going to have to put infinity there. So increasing from five to infinity, right? Decreasing where? Well, we already figured that out, right? Negative infinity over two. Is that two? Pretty close. So minus infinity to 2 is where it's decreasing. And then we've got this one has that unusual constant piece in the middle. So constant from where? 2 to 5, right. So again, remember, always give your answers in terms of the x-axis, not in terms of the y-axis. Very tempting to do, but always in terms of the x-axis. These points right here are not quite turning points, OK? There's definitely a bend in the curve right there, okay? But those are not turning points. A turning point uh, is where it switches from increasing to decreasing, or vice versa, okay? Uh, decreasing. Is that what I said? Increasing to decreasing, or decreasing to increasing. But if it's switching from decreasing to constant, not a turning point, okay? So that is a special point on the graph. But it's not classified as a turning point, okay? Turning point only where it switches from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Uh -huh. Okay, let's try another one there, okay? So I'll let y'all do that one. That one has no constant piece, so that was a more typical one, okay? So... Uh, Tell me, where is that one increasing? 
and where is that one decreasing? And this one does have a couple of turning points, okay? A couple of places where it's switching uh, from increasing um, to decreasing. It's like I wiped out part of my x-axis there. Let me put it back in. Okay. All right. So y'all write that one down. Okay. Where is it increasing and where is it decreasing? Give it your best eyeball there. Okay. Okay, let me ask someone here. Maria, is Maria here? Maria, Maria, where is it? You get the hard one, increasing. So where is it increasing? To, uh, it's increasing from negative 5 to what? <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you started at minus 5 because that's where the x-axis, where I started labeling the x-axis, okay? But again, the it, and that's a reasonable place to start. But because the graph is not, I don't cut the graph off here explicitly uh, with uh, dots, that means that actually this curve is continuing. That's what you have to assume. That's a little bit unfair, but that's what you have to assume. So it's going to be continuing like this, all right? Yeah, so where it really starts increasing is what? Negative infinity and then going up to this. It's this point right there, isn't it? Can you see where that is on the x-axis? What is that? Negative 2, right, yeah. From negative infinity to negative 2, okay? Yeah, Maria, it was a little bit unfair because Maria's all the, way, all the way in the back, all right, okay? So she's squinting here. That's one place where it's increasing, but it's increasing again, Maria. Where's the second piece where it's increasing? Starting at what? Can you see it? What now? Yeah, right there, okay? So starting at 2 and going to where? Infinity, right. Yeah, okay, got it. Got it perfect. And those two points right there, what are those called? Turning points, right. Those are called turning points. All right. Now, uh, so, yeah, those are called turning points. That's where it changes direction, where it's going to change direction. Uh, uh, Diana, is Diana here? Ah, Diana. So you get the easy one now. See, Murray has already answered the hard part, so you get the easy part. Uh, so uh, where is it decreasing? Negative 2 to 2, exactly right. So decreasing from minus 2 over to 2, okay? All right, 
Um, now, what it's going to be very important to us, what's going to be very important to us is, of course, finding these turning points and also estimating or finding the coordinates of the turning points, okay? Because those coordinates of those turning points are going to help us um, answer practical questions. So not just the x coordinate of the turning point, but also the y coordinate of the turning point is going to be useful to us. And that y coordinate of the turning point, that has special names. Okay? So I'm going to talk about that next time. What do you call the y coordinates of turning points? All right? Okay? But again, turning point is where it switches uh, direction from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Okay? Um, all right. <clears throat> That's a quick review of direction. Okay? We'll finish up with this piece next time.